I'm Tim Barton. I uh, work in Vancouver, as Erin was saying, with Bunton Associates. And uh, I guess Vancouver has seen a lot of changes in recent years. Um, there's obviously an established kind of rapid transit system there with the, with the SkyTrain. And that means there's been a lot of, a lot of changes. So this is Brentwood in 1961, uh, obviously a suburban mall. And now they're kind of developing plans like this. And this thing is now under construction. So uh, I guess I'm uh, coming here and uh, hoping that I can give you some kind of, I don't know, tips or warnings or uh, strategies to how to help kind of pull these things off. Because I think that the main, the main thing we found and that the main topic of this presentation is I think the, the dichotomy of planning objectives and some of the kind of transportation engineering realities of these, uh, of these TOD developments, these kind of more dense urban mixed use developments. Uh, just to give you a really quick uh, idea of what we're going to do. Uh, planning theory for transjointed developments, hopefully most people know that already. Uh, planning versus engineering, not really, but uh, hopefully we'll get over that point. Um, and then there's a couple of key examples that I was going to use to illustrate some of these uh, facts. Um, Oak Ridge and Brentwood, these two kind of major projects that Bunt's uh, been privileged to be involved in in, in the Vancouver region. Um, and then do we have the right tools? Uh, I think this is really important to, to talk about as well. So planning theory uh, for transjointed developments. So I think hopefully everybody in the room agrees that if we are going to accommodate the people that everyone tells us are flocking to our cities, if we're going to accommodate them, it makes sense to locate them in places where people can walk and bike and, and take transit, right? Uh, rather than putting them on the outskirts. Hope everybody uh, agrees with that. If not, hopefully I can convince you. However, I think also people realize, as I was saying, that there are, that there are challenges with this as well. Um, this is one of your transit-oriented development plans. Fantastic. Um, and as you can see, it's, it's got mixed use. It's got a, a good network, a good grid of streets. Um, it's probably been designed to be very walkable and bikeable and all of these great things. And that's fantastic. But as many of you, or some of you may have experienced, when you get to it and you get to the approvals process, um, be careful what I said. I don't want to paint people in boxes, but it can be that the transportation engineering department then has major concerns about traffic and about congestion. And this is Low Heat Highway by Brentwood. And as you can see, it's under construction right now. That is a fairly recent uh, Google image. Um, and so you kind of get this dichotomy of worldviews, right? So that's, that's hopefully what we can uh, work our way through. One, one thing to say, I guess, about Vancouver in terms of the more people coming, uh, there's about 2 million people in the Metro Vancouver region at the moment, and that's anticipated to grow by another million people by about 2040, um, and an increase in jobs as well. So just to kind of lay it out in terms of uh, Vancouver anyway, I'm not quite sure what the stats are for Edmonton, but that's a, a lot more people, 50% <laughs> increase in the number of people coming in a timeline where I'll just about maybe still be working if I haven't saved up enough money to retire by then. So it's kind of, it's, <laughs> it's not out there somewhere in the future. It's like it will, most of us in this room will probably still be working at that point, right? Uh, so to illustrate some of these points, I just want to focus on two, two key examples, uh, Oak Ridge and Brentwood. Now, not all of you may be aware of those things are. So for people who are less familiar with Vancouver, um, here's a little map of what uh, Vancouver looks like. If a giant person took paintbrushes and uh, drew lines on things. So Oak Ridge is actually in the city of Vancouver proper. Um, and Brentwood is actually in the next municipality across to the east, which is Burnaby. So uh, different approaches from each municipality, which is why they make good, uh, in some ways, contrasting examples. And those are the rapid transit lines. Uh, that dash green line heading up towards Coquitlam is where I live, uh, which is, should be happening next year. So it should be opening next year. So that's very exciting for me. So this is what uh, Oak Ridge looks like at the moment, which may surprise you because it looks very suburban and very sprawly. Um, it was built, obviously, as a kind of town centre uh, back in the 80s. Uh, way before the Canada Line came, which is the rapid transit station that was built uh, in time for the 2010 Winter Olympics, uh, relatively recently. Um, it is, I'm going to make sure I get my stats right here, it is about 65,000 square metres of mainly retail, um, one level suburban mall on about just over 11 hectares with an FSR of 0.6. That's for the planners. 
And the surrounding, the surrounding sites mainly suburban in nature, as you can see, although that is already beginning to change. So planning to more than double uh, the retail and add 2,900 residential units onto the site as well, uh, and a bunch of office and some community amenities. So we get to about 440,000 square meters of total floor area and, a, and an FSR of 3.8. So the rezoning was approved in March 2014, uh, which you're thinking, well, that was a while ago. Um, but I'm still working on the project because after they got approved, they decided to kind of go back and kind of remodel quite a few aspects of the project. So it's going to have to go through rezoning again, um, which I guess is fine for consultants. We get paid to do the same work again. Yeah, but most of it's still, still remaining intact, right? So it, it is a big site. It's going to generate some traffic. No one is denying it's going to generate new car trips. This is the current mode split. Uh, it's before I flip to the next slide. So it's actually already doing a fairly good job. 55% uh, of people by car. The Canada line, the, the rapid transit line that connects Richmond and the airport to downtown Vancouver, of which Oak Ridge is on, is moving quite a lot of uh, people at 22%, with other buses doing about another 10%. Uh, so it's not doing too bad. So uh, this was what I was just talking about. That's the current uh, GFA, and then the proposed GFA is going forward as well. So pretty massive increase. So this is what it's proposed to uh, look like in the future. Pretty busy, pretty big. Um, even using low trip rates, um, it's, and, and actually, and I'll come back to trip rates later on, vehicle trip rates. Uh, we're using a vehicle trip rate of 0 0.22 uh, trips per residential unit in the PMP hour, which is about half the standard ITE rate if you look it up in the book. But as I say, we'll get back to why that's a good thing to not use the book. So it's already busy, right? Uh, that intersection, yeah, it looks very green. It looks very green in the picture, but uh, you know, it's artists uh, embezzling things. Um, so that's the 41st in Canby. So it's two major arterial intersections. It's already operating uh, at capacity at peak times. Essentially, like that's kind of probably not surprising uh, very much. So the blue, the blue blocks are the current traffic, and the red blocks are the additional traffic that we're predicting is going to be generated on top of what's already being generated. Right. So about. 2,900 or 3,100 peak hour vehicle trips at the moment at peak times, and thinking that that's probably going to go up to kind of 5,300, 5,500 trips. So traditionally, once we've worked out that part, we would also be looking at background traffic that's already there. And this is the kind of traditional traffic impact assessment methodology. We would be uh, growthing up the background traffic and applying some kind of background traffic growth rate as well. and. Um, once we've done that, we probably land up recommending widening some streets and uh, widening some intersections out and all of that kind of stuff. However, that's not going to happen as part of this development. The city of Vancouver, for starters, has got a policy since 1997, believe it or not, that they wouldn't increase vehicle capacity on their streets. And they don't, they don't have room to do it even if they wanted to, really. So it's probably a pretty easy policy to pass. Um, it's completely built out the city, right? Uh, it doesn't have, if, if you're going to widen streets, you're expropriating private property, which in Vancouver these days is very, very expensive. Yeah, and, and, and the, the city's just to kind of uh, uh, or give uh, status to the city where it's due, their transportation 2040 plan definitely talks about even taking away road space as well. So uh, they're even going beyond that. We essentially, the street network is going to get used to cap, cap future vehicle traffic in the peak hours. So that was kind of established early on. There's no new capacity. The capacity is what it is. We're not going to get any more vehicles through that intersection. And so that was kind of understood. So when it's not a predict and provide approach, it's no, we're capping it. Um, which means background traffic has to go down in the peak hour. And that might sound like a crazy, a crazy idea to uh, put forward in a report. Um, but this is a huge project, and it's going to get built out over 10 years. So when we actually did the math, that resulted in a 1% decrease in background traffic over a 10-year period. And everybody seemed fine with that. Um, and that was accepted. But is it realistic? So uh, this is a map of population in Vancouver. And the green line is the population line. Um, and the red lines and the blue line is traffic. So as the population in Metro Vancouver has gone up in recent years, in fact, I think, sorry, that's the city of Vancouver, um, traffic has gone down. So just from a, from a starting point there, just because your population is increasing does not mean your vehicular traffic is increasing as well. And that's testament to the fact that new developments have gone in 
in more transit accessible locations. Just to go through these quickly, even at particular intersections um, that you could compare with the intersection at the Oak Ridge development, uh, traffic is also either flatlining or kind of going on a downward trend in recent years as well. And these two intersections, Cambium Broadway and Cambium Marine Drive, have seen significant amounts of development as well. And on a even a more regional scale, um, this is information is from Translink, our regional transit agency. Once again, a lot of flatlining in terms of uh, vehicle traffic, and that is daily traffic, not peak hour traffic. And this is a graph that Gordon Price likes to use, if you know Gordon Price, uh, he's the director of the city program in Vancouver, um, even showing, it's, it's a little bit messy, but it's, it's essentially showing the traffic in and out of uh, downtown Vancouver is kind of sort of remained stable, even going back, you know, 20, 30 years or something, which is, which is pretty pretty fascinating when you kind of consider all the changes and all the growth that's occurred in the city. So where does this traffic go and, and where are we saying for the, this Oak Ridge example where we're saying background traffic has to decrease in order to accommodate this uh, large development, where, where does this traffic go? Well, it turns out it's got pe plenty of places to go, right? And uh, You could travel at a different time of day. Um, planners especially remember when you're faced with this traffic information, this is a peak hour model there's lots of other hours in the day that traffic can spread out to and believe me coming from living near London in England there's plenty of peak spreading that can take place um, you could take a different route so you just you just change the route you could get on transit or ride your bike or walk changing your mode of travel you could change your destination that grocery store that used to be a 10 minute drive away is now essentially a 15 minute drive away due to congestion but there's another one over there that's a 12 minute drive away so you you just shift your traffic your your travel pattern um, or maybe you stay at home. You just order the pizza online or order your groceries online. I, I don't know if that happens in Edmonton, but we actually order our groceries online now and it turns up in a van for us uh, when we ask it to, which is pretty cool. I could talk for another 30 minutes all about parking, and I'm not going to, but I thought it was maybe deserved just one slide on parking just to, because uh, it, it's a huge issue. Parking actually is a bigger issue than traffic for the Oak Ridge project. Um, and it, it's kind of funny, like as a consultant, you sometimes find yourself arguing different sides of the same coin, almost in the same project. And on this one, the, the retail parking ratios landed up being very conventional. Um, I, I don't know what your experiences are here, but anchor tenants seem to have a lot of power with lease agreements. And uh, we're essentially stuck with the anchor tenants parking requirement, which is stuck back in the 1970s somewhere. Um, otherwise, the project just doesn't go ahead. So the city of Vancouver wanted us to lower the retail parking requirement, but we weren't able to. On the flip side, um, the city was not that happy with our proposed uh, residential parking uh, supply because it was so low. Um, Metro Vancouver has done some huge sort of studies about uh, parking demand and parking and vehicle ownership. The average uh, demand for vehicles for residential units close to transit is 1.15 vehicles per unit in Vancouver at the moment. In Oak Ridge we were proposing about 0.5 and that's that's across the board um, so that includes a lot of low income that's low income housing and rental housing as well so that's an average the the market stuff was a little bit higher than that but still less than one. Um, I think the proposal is about 70 car share vehicles are going to be located on the site so there's a there's a strategy behind that right. There's also an aquifer underneath the entire site, which is one of the reasons why you don't want to go down more than three levels of parking or whatever it was. So moving on from one to another, this is Brentwood. This is on the Millennium Line. So this is in Burnaby. Uh, so a little bit of a different urban context, I guess. Um, maybe a little bit, well, I was going to say more suburban, but then we established that Oak Ridge is a fairly <coughs> suburban um, fairly suburban as well. Low heat highway that is running this way through the site, north is actually that way. Um, that's a major east-west arterial, we'll get into that in a second. Burnaby developed their Brentwood Town Centre plan a long, long time ago, as I showed you in that first photo in the 1960s. Um, that's what it's proposed to look like, by the way. A lot of towers, more than Oak Ridge. So currently about 50,000 square metres of retail, uh, very low FSR, about 0.44 FSR on about 11 hectares again. 
and propose to so lower than Oak Ridges at the moment and proposing to go higher than Oak Ridges proposing to go uh, with about 4,000 residential units and an FSR of about four and a half. So pretty, pretty dense. And it does not have this amazing grid network that Oak Ridge does, which I think is one of the main differences. As I said, Lougheed is this major east-west arterial street. And there aren't a lot of others. You have Hastings, which is already uh, chock-a-block, if you understand that English colloquialism, um, in the mornings. And then it's basically Highway 1, the Trans-Canada Highway, is your kind of other major east-west connector. So there aren't a lot of alternative routes. Does this site have less capacity to displace background traffic? would be my question. So on the right hand side is a typical kind of suburban mode split and then on the, on the left hand side is what we were kind of projecting and estimating for the future site. Um, I will skip the, the, I'll skip the details of kind of how we came up with our modal split estimate but we basically went back, we used ITE trip rates which we knew were from a suburban context and uh, turned them into person trips and then turn them back into vehicle trips once we'd established a person trip rate as opposed to a vehicle trip rate. Anyway, Burnaby made them jump through a lot more hoops than I had to jump through for my Oak Ridge project, and they came up with the same answer that we did, so, and the same trip rate. Future vehicle volumes obviously still expected to about double um, what the current site was, was generating. There were some changes planned for Lougheed already. It was going to go from five to six lanes, so that kind of still went ahead. And also, trying to create a better grid as well meant some traffic could not go through this major intersection that there was there that I showed you on the previous slide. Um, zero background traffic growth was also assumed as well. And taking all of these things into account, that may, the, the main intersection there was still anticipated to operate about what it does today. So kind of got away with it there as well. And, Actually, interestingly, just, just to the west of, the, of this site here, we're currently involved with another site, and this time the city of Burnaby has actually asked the question, what will it take, uh, or how much does background traffic have to go down in order to accommodate this development? So they've, they've even moved on in terms of what they were looking for between these two major developments. And in Burnaby's case, we actually use the regional traffic model, which is based on ME software, to actually model that and show where the traffic would displace to. Um, and Burnaby is happy with that. So that's interesting. In, in Vancouver, we just said background traffic had to go down, and they said, OK. So two different municipalities, two different. Uh, basically, uh, don't, don't spread this around too much. My philosophy is as you start with Vancouver, and as you go further east, you basically get wider travel lanes, bigger cars, and different, more suburban style requirements from everything. And your kind of uh, level of service you have to achieve basically goes up as you go further east. That's my theory. So do we have the correct tools? And uh, firstly, philosophically, um, you know, the tools that we use and, and what we measure ourselves against will, to a large degree, influence the outcomes that we see. So this is your municipal development plan. Um, and on the left-hand side, I just pulled out a few things uh, related to your strategic goals, which, which sound great, right? The things that we were talking about um, at the beginning of this presentation. Um, we want integrated land use and transport. We want good mixed use uh, developments. We want to create complete streets that everybody wants to walk and cycle on. We want urban agriculture. We want all this great stuff. But that's not what you ask us to do when we do a TIA. You ask us to make sure that the traffic keeps moving. And if you ask us to make sure the traffic keeps moving, then you'll get wider streets. If you ask us to look at what the health impacts are of the transportation system, you might get some funny faces to start with, but you will eventually start getting the answers that you want and you'll start getting what you want. If you ask us to do something different to that, then you'll get something different to that as your outcome as well. So maybe we should just design the street that we want, right? And let the traffic just figure its way out and, 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 and do all of that, right? We'll kind of come back to that. Point. So traditionally, and we kind of talked about this already, this, this is what we do, right? And I guess this is the first thing that I want to say. Like, we've got we to think about how we address this, and that's background traffic. This is our kind of, tradi our kind of traditional sum that we go to, right, uh, which includes a growth in background traffic. But as, I, as I've already talked about, I would kind of question that, uh, that assumption that you're going to just keep on increasing your background traffic. And I know Vancouver is not Edmonton, but... Uh, as you know, you're starting to get your first light rail lines and uh, and all of this kind of stuff, and I, I, you have to think about you have to think about that. And the point is, you induce traffic. 
So it's not just about predicting uh, an increase in background traffic and then just accommodating it. It's the fact that you, that you induce it. And guess what? If, if you build it, if you build it, they will come. The younger people are thinking, what's that about? I don't understand that at all. <laughs> That's a Kevin Costner movie. The young people are still thinking, I don't even know who Kevin Costner is anymore. <laughs> I'm getting old. Um, yeah, so a, a huge problem is that if you, if you build your roads to accommodate this huge projected background growth, um, yeah, it's, it's this self-fulfilling prophecy, right? You, you induce traffic. And you land up building places where nobody wants to walk and everyone has to drive. A bit like this random street that I found on the internet. Um, and you don't get the health outcomes that you wanted from your municipal plans and you don't get the transit and you don't get the walking and you don't get the biking that you said you wanted in your municipal plans. You know, with Oak Ridge, we talked about how background traffic needed to decrease in order to allow site traffic to take its place. So rather than increasing an induced demand, you're essentially taking capacity away from existing traffic. So can you actually, can you do that? Is there evidence to suggest that as road capacity decreases, traffic volumes will decrease as well? If you build it, they will come. If you don't build it, will they not come? So actually, there's a lot of studies out there that show that if you take away road space, you actually decrease traffic, amazingly enough. And there is a lovely British study, obviously, um, it's pretty old now as well, but they looked at 72 case studies for road space reallocation schemes from around the world, whether it was uh, bus lanes or cycle lanes or long-term maintenance projects, which took away road capacity. And they found, as you can see on there, the mean decrease in traffic was about 10%, the average was about 20%. Um, the traffic did actually uh, disappear. And if you remember back to the little kind of uh, slide I had before about where the traffic can go, like, it's got it's got options right and and this was this isn't just one study this was a, a huge number of studies the picture on the left you got this is kind of a very overused example of uh, in Seoul in South Korea right where it was like this 10 lane road and they day lit the river and the traffic kind of disappeared air quality went up lots of land values went up lots of great things happened but but the traffic disappeared and that's not just on that street it disappeared on the parallel streets as well I'm not cheating so in summary, during peak times, traffic generally fills the space that you give it. If you give it more space, you'll probably get more traffic. So trip rates. So all the engineers in the room really know this. Uh, I'm sure they've kind of memorized the entire book by now. This is the Institute of Transportation Engineers uh, Trip Generation Manual. So this is the, the book that we open up. Um, I'd say do not use this for uh, transit-oriented development. Um, it even says in the handbook that accompanies this book, it says collect local examples where you can. And I really would encourage that as well. Um, IT has done some research now focusing on TODs um, so that they are getting there. But this, this book kind of still stays um, as it is. So on the left, I've, this is, say you've got a, a theoretical 200 unit condominium tower. Um, if this is the number of vehicle trips that it generates, the red the red bar is if you use the ITE rates. The blue bars are a whole bunch of studies that we've collected around SkyTrain stations, rapid transit stations in Metro Vancouver. I think the, the green is the average. So it's, it's pretty much half or less than half of the IT rate. And planners may be thinking, so what? The, the answer is, once we throw that into our model and we tell you that you need to signalize an intersection or you need an extra left turn lane or something, if you get the trip rate right, you don't have to put that extra turn lane in or, or whatever it is, and you keep your street narrow and you make it more attractive for pedestrians and stuff. So this, this stuff does count. Um, in, the, in the UK, um, there's a system called Trix, which is an online database that's updated regularly. Um, you plug in your development, you tell it where it is. Uh, is it sort of urban or suburban context? Does it have transit lines next to it, et cetera? And it will create you a custom trip rate uh, d based on all the data that it has. So we are a, a long, long way from that, unfortunately. So the other, kind of the last main point here I want to talk about is the, is the model, right? So we have the, the highway capacity manual uh, here in Canada, and it's the go-to resource for traffic operations and intersections, right? And it rates the level of service of an intersection, which is a function of delay from the scale of A to F. Um, so Remember, again, planners, this only applies to the peak hour. And in fact, the way that these models are often run, they're only relating to the peak 15 minutes of the peak hour. And so you get this stuff back, and it says, 
you know, there's going to be these huge delays on this road. Um, you've got to ask yourself, do you want to make infrastructure, infrastructure decisions, multi-million dollar decisions, based on accommodating the peak 15 hours of the day, or the peak 15 minutes of the day? Um, and if you look at some of these graphs, it will depend on uh, it'll depend on the road, like what the graph looks like, obviously. Um, but if you know, if it's a fairly peaky graph, um, if you made the decision, I'm not going to accommodate the peak hour. I'm going to accommodate the hour next to the peak hour, for example. Um, you could be looking at sort of radically different streets if you're going to do that, or even not accommodating the peak 15 minutes, but the 15 minutes next to the 15 minutes, right? There's different ways of looking at it. The other, the other thing that always bugs me is the language. Um, who wants to be an E or an F? That sounds terrible, right? We all want to be, we all want to be A's. Um, if you had an urban road, if, if you had a kind of arterial road or a major collector road in an urban environment and it was LOSA, it would be horrible. It would be totally over-designed. There'd probably be no people on it. Nobody would be able to cross it. Um, and E, in that kind of situation, would be far more preferable um, in, in almost all measures, right? And yet, E sounds, sounds terrible, right? So I don't know if there's some way that we could maybe kind of change that system, uh, just change the language in it. Like, even the language would help, I feel. Um, just to conclude then, Municipalities obviously under pressure to densify and uh, grow around new and existing rapid transit stations. Traffic and parking pressures aren't going to go away. There's no silver bullet, I'm afraid. If you were looking for that, it's not there. Um, planners and engineers need to work together. I'm so happy that you're, you're here and you're mingling like at a wedding. Um, we need to ensure that developments work for people, not just, not just the cars, right? And if you want those health outcomes that you talk about in your municipal plans, maybe you should change the questions that you're asking of your developers. As consultants, we can only do what we're asked to do, right? Within, and I would say, within an urban setting, traffic volume should be capped by capacity in the peak hours, rather than pandering to a predict and provide approach as well. Concentrate on what the, the street should look like, and the traffic will adjust. And I leave you with this one last point. Um, you may have heard of it. Marchetti's constant states that commute times have essentially remained unchanged since the Neolithic era. Whether people are walking or whether they're on their horse, a bike, a car, like people find this like equilibrium, like the, the amount of time they're willing to dedicate each day to actually commuting and getting to work, right? It, it implies that people adjust their lives um, to adapt to changes that they're faced with, right? Um, what I'm saying is that we adapt as a society to change it, and we can use and embrace that adaptability uh, to build communities that we can be proud of.